Good morning, welcome to the UOB Southeast Asian Gallery 6. I'm Li Ling and along with my team, we'll be bringing you on a journey to exploring the themes of social realism through some artworks. So, what is social realism? It is the artwork done to draw attention to the real social-political conditions of the working class, so as a mean to critique the power structures behind these conditions. As we go on, we'll see how these themes are being explored through the lenses and depiction by the various artists. So first, I'll be introducing you to this artwork that was done by Fernando Pito Amosolo. The artist used oil on canvas and it was done mainly with neutral and warm colours, which gives us a realistic setting of the painting. This was created in 1942, which marked the start of the Japanese occupation of the Philippines. The Japanese occupation in the Philippines lasted for three years, between 1942 to 1945. This was the point of time when the Philippine resistance movement had opposed the Japanese with an underground and guerrilla movement. Despite the Japanese campaign uh, and surveillance uh, of its citizens, um, the guerrilla movement continued to grow. So what's interesting about this artwork is that the artist had made the painting look peaceful and calm, yet if you look closely, uh, you'll be able to see all the details. For the first thing, you can see a marketplace where all the Filipinos are chatting happily um, with a Japanese soldier surveilling in the background. Mm. It's a bit unusual that they are too happy in this scene. So in my opinion, uh, this citizen seems to be plotting something um, while using gambling as a disguise. If I was to ask you what else you really notice from the painting, uh, do you notice that the Japanese flag were actually scratched? However, it's not very clear whether it's the artist or the citizens um, the one who scratched the flags. At the bottom of the painting, um, the lady vendor caught my eyes. So usually a lady, when she sit, uh, when she wear a skirt, she should sit with both legs closed. But this lady is a bit unusual, so she sat with her leg wide open, which is not lady-like. Um, however, yeah, it tells me that she might be ready for something that we are not expecting. Maybe she will take a gun or a knife or a skirt. To summarize, this artwork has given me insight on the social political situation in Philippines during the Japanese occupation. It might look quiet and peaceful at the first glance, yet it captures the emotion of how people in the Philippines might be feeling at a point of time. Uh, in this case, it felt uh, as though the presence and the unity of the Philippines were much more stronger than the Japanese soldier in this marketplace. Um, I saw a quote somewhere which I felt uh, reflects what these people might be thinking in the painting. Uh, we shoulder the unbearable, accomplish the impossible, and endure the uh, unthinkable by the intensity of our love. Uh, this quote um, might be a good way of telling us how people in the war should be sacrifice themselves and the fear that they might be feeling, but yet they are courageous to fight for freedom for their country. So I'm done with mine, and next I'll pass on to Rehan to take you through the next painting. I'm Rehan, and I'll be presenting the artwork called Burung Hitam, Matahari and Manusia, done by the artist named Afandi. So the, actually the artwork translates to the blackbird, the sun, and land. So before I actually do a deep dive into what the artwork and the explanations and the meanings behind the artwork, I'll actually talk a bit, I'll talk briefly about the artist's background. So Afandi was actually kind of regarded as a very important modern Indonesian artist. So during this period of time, actually he travelled further to the kind of for his artistic career. And actually one of the more notable places was actually during his travels to the Sampinikan, which is the Santinikan Arts University in India and to be exact actually in Bhopal. He was there between 1949 to 1951. This time period was actually really important because it actually gives us a time period of actually when the painting was actually being made. But I'll talk about that later. So what was interesting that well, when, when you actually arrived at the university was really regarded as a professional 
painter and then was given a scholarship. So actually, he used this scholarship to kind of fund his travels around India, which actually allowed him to see many different places in India, to kind of experience what was life back then, which I feel was actually really important to the making of this work. So now I will actually be moving to the explanation of the painting on the terms of the technical and time. So, like I said, why I mentioned the time period between 1949 to 1951 because actually Urong, Hitam, Patari and Manuse was done in 1950 which actually gives us just nice in the middle of his travels around India and his time at the Santinikan Art University. So, because since he was around the area, so this painting was actually kind of an observation of what he actually saw. So, the painting actually, so now I'm sure I'm going to move to the subject matter of the painting. So actually the painting depicts almost like a labourer it depicts a labourer, a very thin old man carrying almost like a musical instrument in his right arm so actually then I'll like beginning with facial features he has a very wrinkled forehead his eyes are closed quite peacefully and his mouth is like almost fully open it's as if he was grinning despite having like like some teeth missing which I guess in modern day when we have missing teeth we are kind of like scared to smile because you know it's very shameful but it's interesting because this particular person just or the particular subject is or maybe a funny just wanted to show you know, him smiling about the teeth but it will show that he was wary but he still right there, there was a sense in his demeanor that you know this person was still very strong and still wanted to carry on and you also see that he was actually carrying a he, he was dressed in simple clothing carrying like a motley bag probably like filled with his belonging so actually before I go further in depth like I just want to ask a question to the floor do you guys think like was he like a musician wandering for or searching for a living personally I think he was because judging from you know going back and referring back to the painting because of how he carried the instrument and the motley bag and it was like a pretty like bulky bag by what I see from the painting I'm assuming that those are his belongings and he was he almost behaved like a nomad and wanderer, wanderer. So I guess now moving to like how I guess Afandi's ways of doing things was that I guess Afandi also behaves almost like a nomad or like a actually not I wouldn't call it a nomad but like a sojourner. He almost gives me the essence of almost like how he behaves like a photographer because of how he travels around. So like what he did was actually during his travels he would kind of write down and inscribe things that kind of particularly interest him, which I guess reflects this painting. He probably he probably see. Maybe it wasn't just one individual, but it was the multitude of individuals that were that had a similar job scope and he kind of probably took certain aspects and parts of it and put it together. And he kind of also, I guess in a sense, this painting reflected his life back in Indonesia too. So I guess moving on, so I think what was interesting was that I think what I particularly picked up upon was actually um, his painting style was quite interesting because he almost reminded me of Van Gogh with the multiple use of the line work and especially the strong emphasis on the facial features. But what was, I guess, what made it, what made him really kind of different, what made him kind of like an enigma in a sense is because like Vincent Van Gogh was an artist during the post impressionistic period of time. But what was interesting because like post impressionism was normally, or I wouldn't call it normally, but was associated always with painting landscapes. But what was different here was the focus wasn't inherently a landscape but what I could tell was actually it was a landscape of the people there which I found really interesting and the colours used actually reflect colours used in social realism so to actually go or to give an understanding of what social realism is is colours that actually reflect the social political issues and colours that are used actually often reflect the working class which was actually seen because there was a strong use of white there was a strong use of browns and in a sense also because when I did research too, looking back, India during back then the climate was really hot and there's a sense of how like that painting kind of accentuates that hot climate. And there was actually, if you realise at the top of the painting or the top of the man's forehead, there was actually a sun. A sun which actually had hues of blue and very dampened yellow, like pulling it down almost as if it was sitting down, which will bring me to my next part actually. So normally when you see like the sun and so especially in Singapore because we are a country that is super humid and hot, People, we always tend to complain like, yo, why is the weather so hot? Oh my god, it's so sweaty. But I think what Afandi is, it was a lot interesting because he saw the sun as uh, as an energy, as, as an energy that provided people with the ability to carry on, to move on forward with the work. Because like, actually, when 
I deep down research, the sun was actually a very reoccurring uh, artist head or a reoccurring motif in his artworks. And just to give a brief understanding of what the artist hand is, the artist hand is it refers to a type of branding that you can see in an artist's work. So it's, it's kind of a small little detail that you put to tell people like, you know, this is my artwork, or this is what my artwork would look like. So going back to the context of the sun motif, actually towards the bottom left of the painting, you can actually see an, inscri an inscription that says, Dengan, uh, dengan matahari saya bekerja, dengan dengan tangan saya bekerja, dengan kaki saya maju ke depan, which I think is interesting because in English it says, you know, the sun is like my energy and with my hands I work and with my feet I move forward, which shows a strong sense of not giving up or not ever giving up, but in a sense it kind of moves like it kind of moves like in the sense that like it's to never give up it's like the sun is constantly there and it constantly inspires people to do work as much as you know the hot weather and the climate back then in was really hot despite you know like climate going up and people still still has the happiness and still has the willingness to work to survive it kind of speaks on the humanity it, it kind of speaks on the idea of survival and i guess it gives me the essence of like he was speaking as like beating the struggle because moving a bit deeper when I actually researched a little bit more was what was interesting was actually because initially when I was researching I find it interesting that you know there was no mention of a blackbird just yet or there was no there was no physical appearance of the blackbird till I realized actually at the top right beside the sun there was the blackbird and I wanted to understand the significance of the blackbird and going into like deep research and understanding that actually the blackbird had very strong connotations to also witchcraft but also death. So inherently this painting kind of speaks about life and death, the, the struggle of living and working and death was kind of like, death was a constant thing lurking in the man's background but the sun was there shining it forward, giving the man strength but death was constantly behind and death and the birds could, could very well represent many things, it could be probably the, the working situations and the working conditions back then reflecting on how he used social political colours, so, I mean social realism colours, it could kind of reflect that you know probably the landscape there wasn't taken too well off hence why you know there was a lot of birds and birds are also known as associated with like pestilence like dirt disease so it was it, it was really interesting and it was a super in-depth work but that's enough for me now and i'll bring it over forward to my next colleague that also will be speaking on a very similar context and like a worker too Hi everyone, I'm Esther and so today I'll be telling you more about the work by Chanati, which is the epic poem of Malaya. And so more background about this artist is that he came from China in 1937 and then after that uh, he became a resident here in Singapore. Yeah, and this work that he's done here uh, is epic poem of Malaya and so this it was actually done in 1955, it's just in the context of uh, Singapore being a very tumultuous um, time, that going through a very tumultuous time at, the, at that season. And um, in that time, there were the elections going on, and there were also um, the Pony bus riot that was going on as well. And people were just very distraught, and they did not know exactly who they are. And you know, um, having this handbook over here, okay, it actually shows how people actually want to know who they are and, and to really build something about their identity. Okay, so I guess I'll be taking over part of the symbolism aspect. I think speaking about what actually my education mate uh, Esther has actually said was actually really important because as highlighted during the first, it was the first elections and you know with the bus riots, all of these were actually kind of cries for leadership because there wasn't a proper leadership because due to that, 10 years prior, in 1945, the Japanese just has let go of us. So there was an end of an occupation and you know, the British wanted to come back, but there was still a very strong sense of self-governance. Uh, self People wanted their own leaders. And in context, I think Chuamiyati kind of really embodied that in the painting actually, because going into that, you know, it shows a tropical city and then it shows a, not a tropical city, but a tropical landscape, which actually, and then there was the, then the sky is actually featured very dark sky and actually a cyclone from around on the right of the painting. I think like the whole reason for a tropical landscape was not just was not just because of how it was, but you know, I guess showing the vastness of the land kind of showed how the, the great potential that this country had. 
and I guess the cyclone was kind of the reflection of all of these like riots, all of these um, you know strive for leadership. So it was it was in a very tough time. People were really lost. But I think what was interesting, actually moving on to the subject that was actually in the painting, like I think one of the very one, one figure that really pops up first thing and foremost is obviously the man standing upright or the teacher. He's seen holding the hand. He's seen holding on his left hand actually the book called Malaya, and then his right hand. Um, pointing up to the sky and I would like to drag I would like to bring the attention to actually the right hand up to the sky because it's interesting because if you just look above his right hand you can actually see that there is a circle almost a circle in the dark cloud but it shows a ray of light I guess he was kind of playing on the idea of like you know a ray of light and kind of showing it down to that perspective showing that actually there is still hope if you know and, and he is almost it's almost like a very godly kind of um, representation of this because it's as if he's like a messenger and the people sitting down are the people who are lost. It's almost very, it's almost, it, it almost feels like a re revelation actually. And actually moving on to the people actually sitting cross-legged, you could actually see Chabati actually further accentuates the loss and this, like the distraughtness of the people. Because you could see that there are people there ranging, you know, some of them were actually, some of them actually sat down, some of them were standing, some of them were actually peeking through and hearing. And then, like you could tell that their facial, their facial expressions, a lot of them were in a sense really lost. A lot of them, some even closed their face. Some people even looked away. It, it kind of shows that how people back then just didn't want to speak about things or didn't want to speak about politics or maybe people just didn't want to do anything about it. People just, people just wanted a way out. And I think like them being there was a sign that despite how troubled, how, how, how troubled times were back then, people still wanted change. People still sat down, people still give it like people wanted to kind of find their own national identity. And I think it's also interesting because like like if you look at the forefront there's actually a guy with a fly at the back, right? Yes, yeah, yes, I think yes, you kinda wanna yeah. Yes, and so actually like um if you look closely in the painting and you zoom in um, with technology, you can actually see a fly on the man's shoulder. And and then the fly actually um is a symbolism of death and urban of of pestilence, but yeah, okay. Um, there's also another symbolism which is called upcoming change, and so that was uh, quite crucial. And also, in in this context of this painting, it actually shows how much um, like uh, there, how much hope there was even in this about how uh, even with the different things going on, that there will be change, and that change even can lead to a better life in the future. Yeah, and I think it's like completely interesting because like I didn't know that flies actually kind of mentioned that. And I think that small little detail and how you know, Esther kind of elaborated was really important to the work. And moving on the actually the aspects of the colour, I think what was interesting was everybody was basically almost uniformly dressed, which then brings it back to kind of social realism in the sense that, you know, it he like it really represented people of that time, the working class, and especially after the occupation, because digging deeper to what socialism is, I think as explained by the previous presenters, presenters too, is like, yes, it, it's representative of the social political era, which also brings us back to how, you know, the war just ended with the Japanese when we lost, when, when they actually surrendered. Obviously, you know, back then, you know, like money wasn't there, people could only afford these colours, because looking deeper to like social political colours and realism colours, actually brown was a very accessible colour back then because it was cheap to make, so it shows that it, it, it's a lot basically like what he's trying to say but it all ties in together very nicely yeah. Mm -hmm. nice yeah and I think that concludes our our, our joint presentation on the epic poem of Malaya yeah yep and I'll tell you more about the next one yeah hi and so I'm back with another uh, painting right here okay and so this is also another piece done by Chua Mia Thi. and um, before I go more in depth about it anybody would like to guess like what occupation do you think this man in the painting holds? well a context of it is also done in 1955 in the same period or rather same year as the epic poem of Malaya and this painting is oil, oil on canvas and also um, the title of it is actually Road Construction Worker, which is his occupation. And so, very little is actually known about this painting because um, the man in this uh, artwork is actually not identified. And people actually, like, act rather the artist actually just, um, perhaps, he just like approached someone and decided to be like, okay, I'll paint you today. 
but we don't know the full story behind it. But um, and there's actually very little known about it. So, well, um, in the upcoming Seoul exhibition of um, Chanaki, you can actually find out more of that. Hopefully, yes. Okay, but back to the painting. Okay, um, this painting was actually a very very well done painting. In fact, um, the technical skills of the painter can actually be seen through this. Um, as you, as you just look at this artwork, okay, and and it doesn't actually feel like a painting. In fact, it feels like an enhanced artwork. Sorry, an enhanced photograph. Yeah, because um, how realistic this painting looks is actually quite captivating. In fact, and also uh, as you stare into the eye of like the man in this painting, you can actually feel like he's telling you something. Personally, for me, when I first saw this painting, I actually was quite moved and I was not really exactly emotional. I was just like having an aesthetic response, if I may put it that way. Yeah, and in, and this is the first time I actually felt something um, when I looked at an artwork. And so this actually got me um, really interested and also like it also reminded me of um, this quote or rather the same by Shakespeare about how the eyes are the gates to the soul and you know um, as I look at this painting I felt like this man um, even though I don't know him but he's telling me so much about his life and um, of what life is really back in the 1955 and so more about um, this man uh, so uh, in that time Road construction workers were just um, basically they are usually migrant workers that come from overseas in search for a better life, and um, but yet okay when you look at this painting like he's slouching and he's very scrawny and he's just he looks so worried and troubled you know and it really made us made me think whether um, that search for a better life was really there for him or not and also. As we look further um, into the context of our twenty first century as well, um, the our construction workers are also migrant workers, and also how we how how they look uh, at back in nineteen fifty five and how they look now um, might be very different because um, obviously they don't go around half naked and like they really. Um, wear their personal protection equipment and all these things like their vests, their helmets but yet um, I think they, they do still really uh, just sit by the roads um, and have their lunch you know and like the, the context for them did not really change much in fact um, I believe that even uh, in the 21st century if uh, any painter would to approach any construction worker I think maybe their their um, gaze would still be the same because it's still in that state of um, I'm here to search for a better life, but yet that better life was it is it really here? Because even in the uh, in this pandemic, there's like a crisis that they are go they went through, you know. Um, yeah, it's it really got me thinking a lot about how we are treating our construction workers and. Um, tying it back to social realism, you know, um, perhaps at, at that point, social realism is something that um, highlights um, the, the difficulties and the struggles of the people, but um, perhaps even today, even though it is highlighted, has anything changed even today? And with that, I end my presentation and I'll pass the time to Nadia. Hi, I am Nadia and now we'll be moving forward from the 1950s. So, anyone here can read Bahasa Melayu? Okay, I do it for you. So, um, there's actually a quote at the bottom of this artwork which says, Dengan segala alat dan cara, kita pertahankanlah tanah air kita yang bagus ini. Which also translates, With all our tools and all our means, let's defend our beautiful motherland. So um, this artwork touches on social realism and nationalism aspect, but today we'll be just focusing on the social realism. So this artwork is by S. Sujoyono called Kami Present Ibu Pertiwi or Stand Guard Our Motherland. It was created in 1965 where it is two decades after the World War II. And this painting is an oil on canvas. And fun fact, this is one of the majestic 
painting that the artist actually had conceived. So, looking at this artwork, it seems to look like is it is just an ordinary um, peaceful village or a farm, but that is not the case. So, this artwork um, is actually a scene after the World War II, where he took inspiration from his own experience in 1948-1949, uh, where he moved to a village near the Prambanan Temple um, in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. So, I personally believe that this is one of his experiences that was really fresh in his mind or something that he actually personally participated in because even after two decades, he can produce this artwork. So, uh, let me talk a bit about the artwork. So, this piece shows a background of landscape um, of villages, mountain, and also the highlights of Prambanan Temple at the left corner of the art. So, uh, there's also a pink tinge horizon which actually um, shows the minute figures of the refugee trying to seek place in other parts of Indonesia. Okay, um, so at the center of the artwork is actually um, the villagers pushing a cart full of supplies and getting ready to guard the country. And what is obvious in this artwork is the villagers seems to be wearing tattered clothes, some are even in sarong and their farming boots. So none of them are actually in uniform, but they are willing to fight for the nation even if they are not militarily trained. So a little bit short backstory, um, during the war, Dutch actually gave up on uh, defending Indonesia and left all their weapons there. Uh, but after Indonesia independence, um, in 17, on 17 August 1945, um, where Indonesia was free from Dutch and the free from Japanese, um, the country was attacked by Dutch forces who wanted to regain their rule over Indonesia again. This made the villagers actually very angry and like they don't want to be colonized again. So they actually used the resources that the Dutch left to fight the Dutch forces to defend the country. So at this point of time, the economic situation was really bad in the country as the people were poor, investments were halted, and inflation was super high. So um, as you do you know, art usually uh, is from the historical past of Indonesia. Uh, instead of producing the art style in the early 20th century, which idealized the representation of beautiful um, scenery and landscape of Indonesia, he chose to produce works that focus um, more on the everyday life and issues of Indonesia during the colonial regime. So with social political issues, it makes the people of the country unite from being colonized and also um, are ready to take risks to defend the country. So fun fact, he actually joined politics in 1955, which shows how patriotic he is to Indonesia. And it may be um, the influence uh, for him to actually change his art style to realism. So his artwork are often influenced by slogans from Sokarno, the former president of Indonesia. So um, for this painting, he actually was influenced by the slogan which translates in English, give me 1000 youth, I will shake the mountain. But if you give me 10 men, I will shake the world. So as Sujana believe that art should raise the spirit of people, especially during the culture political climate, where there was an ongoing struggle with the Dutch between the Indonesian. Social realism artworks was a manner in which social political issues were being highlighted in the post-war era across Southeast Asia, as we've seen in the past few works. It is also one of the most significant developments in the history of modern art in Southeast Asia from 1940s to 1960s, where artists documented political issues and events and used the style of social realism to awaken the feeling of nationalism. It was a tumultuous time for many nations after the Second World War and chasing away their colonizers to find back who they really are as a nation, fighting their independence and appointing their leaders for the country. With many social political imaging, such as the disparity between the rich and poor, 
building a national identity away from the shadows of colonizer, it was filled with uncertainty and violent determination with citizens and from each nation creating a better life from scratch. To conclude, the artist's work we showed today aims to draw attention to the real socio-political condition. In portraying the struggle, they could admit imperfections but want to take a positive and optimistic view of socialist society. Socialist realism at the time implied a simple, easy, popular, realistic style harmoniously combined with a revolutionary content. Thank you for your time today and we hope you enjoy the artworks in this gallery.